Sheikh Saadi of Shiraz, born 1174 and died in 1290. The words ethics and morality are often used interchangeably, even though they do not mean the same thing. Derived from the Greek ethikos, ethics means ethos and character. The word custom and usage also fall within the wider definition of ethics. By contrast, the word morality comes from the Greek root moralis, which refers to the nature of human action rather than the character of the actor. While ancient Greek moral philosophers like Plato and Aristotle have developed detailed theories of morality, the nature of the relationship between the actor and his actions remained both ambiguous and contentious within the ethical framework. After Muslims came into contact with the ancient Greek philosophical and scientific heritage during the 8th and 9th century, influential Muslim philosophers like Al-Kindi and Al-Farabi formulated a new ethical theories in light of the Islamic worldview. The works of these early Muslim thinkers laid the foundation for a new science which became known as Ilm al-Akhlaq, the science of ethics, in their quest to define the common good. The Muslims adopted a different approach to ethics and morality. Thus some like Al-Farabi, Ibn Baja and Ibn Tufayl adopted a philosophical approach to ethics. Others like Al-Ghazali and Fakhreddin al-Razi pursued a theological approach. While yet others like Ibn Taymiyyah and Ibn al-Qayyim al jawziyah for instance, adopted a more religious conscriptual approach to ethics. However, it was Sheikh Sa'di of Shiraz who became one of the most influential exponents of practical ethics. Indeed, he not only clearly defined the common good, he also played a pivotal role in popularizing Islamic morality and ethics. Sheikh Muslih ad-Din Sa'di, known as Sheikh Sa'di for short, was born in the Persian city of Shiraz into a middle-class Muslim family. His father Abdullah was a civil servant by profession and served the then rulers of Shiraz. When Sa'di was still an infant, his father died and this forced his family to experience considerable financial hardship. The poverty and destitution experienced by Sa'di during his childhood remained fixed in his mind and was later recalled most vividly in his writings. In desperation, he and his mother sought refuge with an Arab chieftain who understood their pain and showed sympathy. Normally, when people face such economic hardship, they seek to alleviate their situation by seeking suitable employment. But Sa'di's mother encouraged her son to continue his studies. Being very studious, young Sa'di used to bury himself in his books rather than go out to play games or have fun with his peers. His devotion to his studies impressed his teachers and this prompted a local wealthy patron to volunteer to pay for his education. At school, he followed the standard curriculum of the day and excelled in his studies. Thus, his teachers encouraged him to pursue higher education. Some of the leading centres of Islamic learning and education at the time were in Baghdad, Damascus, Basra, Nishapur, Hira and Isfahan. Accordingly, he proceeded to Baghdad for his higher education and there he composed scores of essays and poems on both religious and moral themes. He was around 21 at the time. He dedicated these essays to his teachers, Sheikh Shams al-Din, who was a professor of literature at the famous Nizamiya College in Baghdad. Impressed by the young writer's erudition and literary ability, the venerable Sheikh agreed to fund his advanced education at Nizabina out of his own pocket. An insatiable seeker of knowledge, Sa'di studied a wide range of subjects including traditional Islamic sciences, philosophy, logic, history, geography, science, and tasawwuf, Islamic mysticism, at the Nizamiya College under the tutelage of eminent professors like Hafiz Abdurrahman ibn Ali ibn al jawzi and Farah ibn al-Jawahir. As the capital of the Abbasid Caliphate, Baghdad at the time was home to some of the Muslim world's leading scholars and thinkers, who willingly imparted knowledge and wisdom to those who were eager to learn. Sa'adi thus moved freely in and out of the religious circles of all the prominent scholars of Baghdad. 
and drank deep from the fountain of Islamic knowledge. During his stay in Baghdad, he also encountered the celebrated Sufi sage Shihab al-Din Umar al-Surawardi, the founder of the Surawadiya Sufi order, who initiated him into his tariqa. According to some of his biographers, he also met Abdul Qadir al-Jilani, the famous founder of the Qadariya Sufi order. But this view is clearly erroneous because Abdul Qadir died in 1166, almost a decade before Sa'di was born. Nevertheless, having completed his higher education and mastered several languages in addition to Arabic and Persian, which was his mother tongue, Sa'di eventually returned home to Shiraz. Here he discovered to his dismay how the socio-political situation had become very volatile and very unpredictable. Indeed, while Sa'di was still in Baghdad, his former patron, Atabek Sa'd ibn Zangi, had been ousted from power by his arch-rival Sultan Giyat al-Din Isfahani, the Khwarizm Shah, and the latter was very suspicious of those who allied themselves with the son of Zangi. And to make matters worse, the Mongols were threatening to wreak havoc throughout that region. This prompted Sa'di to leave Shiraz and travel in pursuit of knowledge. And for the next three decades, that's between 1226 to 1256, he travelled extensively across the Muslim world and explored the lifestyle, culture, traditions and habits of Muslims and non-Muslims alike. During his travels, he visited Arabia in order to perform the sacred pilgrimage, the Hajj, and then proceeded to Syria, Egypt and North Africa. In Tripoli, he was captured by the Franks and forced into hard labour. But he was rescued by a well-wisher who married his daughter to him. However, the marriage did not last long because Sa'di found the girl too intemperate and aggressive for his liking. From North Africa, he travelled to Turkestan, Afghanistan and India, where he met the Hindus for the first time. In India, he visited Punjab, Somnath, Gujarat and Delhi, and later he vividly recorded his experiences of these countries in the form of poetry. And from there, he travelled to Yemen and Abyssinia, which is present-day Ethiopia before proceeding to Mecca to perform yet another pilgrimage. And in all, he performed more than a dozen pilgrimage and freely interacted with people of all races and cultural backgrounds, which enabled him to gain an unrivaled insight into human nature, its frailties and shortcomings, as well as its positive aspects. His advanced training in Islamic theological, philosophical and mystical sciences, coupled with his three decades of travel across the Muslim world, not only broadened Sa'di's intellectual horizon, but also enriched his awareness and understanding of the diversity, which is so characteristic of the human family. Indeed, his observation and admiration of the vast tapestry which constitutes our humanity inspired him to formulate and champion a universalistic ethic which belonged neither to the East and nor to the West. Rooted in the timeless axis of divine wisdom, his global ethic was all about the common good. The common good of all humanity rather than that of a specific group or nation. After returning to his native Shiraz in 1256 at the age of 81, he authored most of his books, treaties and poetry. Considered to be a remarkable example of late blooming, Sa'di completed two of his most famous works, namely the Bustan, the fruit garden, and the Gulistan, the Rose Garden, after his 80th birthday. The former was finished in 1257, while the latter was completed in 1258. And these years also some of the most traumatic periods in the history of Muslim society. While Sa'di was busy writing about the enduring values and principles, which are common to all people, highlighting the importance of truth, honesty, wisdom and toleration, in fostering healthy human relationships, the Mongol hordes emerged from Asia and marched into Baghdad. The Mongols' attack on Baghdad was so devastating that it shocked and horrified Muslims and non-Muslims alike. Although Sa'di made no specific reference to the Mongol sack of Baghdad in his work, as a devout Muslim and practicing Sufi, he must have been devastated by the brutal nature of the Mongol assault on the seat of the Abbasid Caliphate. 
when the Mongols' advance was eventually halted in 1260 by the Mamluks of Egypt. The entire Muslim world breathed a sigh of relief. Amid the prevailing social political chaos, an increasingly frail Sa'di came to enjoy the patronage of Atabek Abu Bakr ibn Sa'd, the son and successor of his former patron, Atabek Sa'd ibn Zangi. He admired this young ruler so much that he dedicated his bustan to him, saying that as long as the sun and the moon continue to rise in the skies, the name of Abu Bakr ibn Sa'd would be fondly remembered by the readers of his bustan. Comprising more than 4,000 couplets, the bustan is today considered to be one of the most widely read works of Persian poetry. Before Sa'di, Persia had produced some of the most influential and gifted poets of the Muslim world, including Abu Majd Majdud Sinai, Omar Khayyam, and Farid al-Din Attar. But with the publication of the Bustan, he established his reputation as one of the most polished and ethical poets of the Muslim world. Although steeped in Islamic theology, jurisprudence, and mysticism, Sa'di's poetry transcended religious formalism to capture the essence of universalistic prophetic wisdom. And that is why theological and dogmatic debates and discussions never interested him. His understanding of Islam was primarily a moral and ethical one, underpinned by the universal Quranic principles and prophetic wisdom. Inspired by the timeless teachings of Islam, Sa'di's moral philosophy combined religious principles, practical ethics and spirituality to create a comprehensive moral code of behaviour in society. And this moral code was a universal one, where the kings, the queens, rulers, saints, philosophers, theologians, as well as lay people, had their roles and responsibilities assigned to them. This was not a code in a legal sense, rather it was a humane, tolerant and all-inclusive code of behaviour. And its foremost objective was the promotion of the common good of all people. In his Bustan, Sa'di spoke a universal language, which transcended formal speech by addressing the human heart, which he considered to be the mirror of universal truth. And that's to say his moral philosophy sought to connect humankind to divinity at a practical level without compromising the sacredness of the latter or undermining the humanity of the former. The Bustan therefore presents a powerful and compelling exposition of universal moral and ethical teaching underpinned by the timeless wisdom of the Quran and prophetic wisdom, without in any way overlooking the practical dimension. In comparison, Sa'di's Gulistan is primarily a lyrical work which consists of interesting, witty and instructive anecdotes, stories and tales which seeks to inspire the reader to lead a normal and equally moral life inspired by the timeless wisdom of Islam. An optimist by nature and a gifted communicator, he analysed human relationships and behaviour through personal observation and he rejoiced when people exemplified good behaviour and etiquettes, but at the same time, he refused to condemn those who fell short of his high moral and ethical standards. He persevered with such people, knowing only too well that we all have our own shares of mistakes and misdemeanours. Therefore, he preferred to drop hints and make suggestions to those who fell short of his high ethical standards. Indeed, he operated like a universal friend who informed people of what they needed to know, and in a language they could all understand without offending anyone. He was wise and entertaining and never dull or boring. A reader of the Gulistan cannot help but smile, reflect and ponder and do so without having to stretch themselves either physically or intellectually. If his wit was refreshing and his eloquence breathtaking, then his understanding of human nature and behavioural psychology was precise. Yet strangely enough, Sa'di claimed to have composed his Gulistan in a hurry, with information left over from the Bustan. In short, his Bustan and Gulistan, Zahdi managed to capture the very essence of Islamic moral and ethical teachings, and in so doing, he helped to popularize the moral and ethical code of Islam as never before. 
As an Islamic scholar and moralist, he is still very popular in Persia and the subcontinent. But as a writer and poet, he is considered to be one of the most polished and gifted Muslim poets of all time. So much so that an Iranian is not generally considered to be literate until he has learned to quote Sa'di by heart. Originally written in Persia, Sa'di's Gulistan and Bustan have also been translated in all the prominent languages of the world, including English, Arabic, Hindi, Urdu, French, German, Bengali, Russian, Turkish, and even Latin. Unfortunately, his exact age at the time of his death is not known. Some say he died at the advanced age of 116, while others suggest he died at the age of 99. Either way, he was laid to rest in his native Shiraz, but his powerful and enduring poetry and moral teachings have continued to influence scholars, writers, poets and lay people alike, both in the East and in the West, up to the present time. Indeed, the following couplets from his Gulistan, which has also been inscribed on the Hall of the United Nations, beautifully summarises his entire moral and ethical philosophy. The humanity of the limbs of one frame. As in creation, their origin is the same. If fate causes one of the limbs to sting, others too will cry in suffering. From the book of Abdul Shabbat, or Manners of Companionship. 